Hello everyone, we're ready to get started. I want to thank all of you for joining today, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we are very delighted to have you. Uh, my name is Giorgio Catolico. I'm with Madcap Software, and I am very thrilled to welcome our guest today, Caroline, User Assistance Team Leader at JHC Systems, and Eloise, Senior Technical Author also at JHC Systems. Uh, today's session is about the best practices on maintaining consistent documentation. Uh, this includes how to use a FLARE project for internal processes, such as authoring guidelines, style and terminology preferences, setting up a publishing schedule, and more. Uh, processes that are essential for not only writers, but for managers too. Uh, Eloise and Caroline presented this at Mad World Dublin in October, and we are excited that you are sharing this with us today. Uh, so welcome again, Caroline and Eloise. Thank you too for so much for joining. As always, we have a lot to cover today, so two quick items of business before we begin. Uh, as a quick reminder, we will be recording this. Now, if you have to leave early, no problem. We will be sending out the link to the recorded webinar to everybody when this is done. Also, there is a questions panel in the GoToWebinar console, and I encourage you to, to use that to ask a question during our webinar today. Now, we won't be stopping to answer your questions in the middle of this presentation, but we would like to take some time after to get to as many as we can and follow up with a question and answer document after the webinar for those questions that we don't get to so that you can check them out. Uh, but we'll try to get to as many as we can after the webinar. Uh, so with that, we have a lot of exciting stuff to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Caroline and Eloise. Thank you, Gio. I'm Caroline, and I'm going to take you through what the Organized Madcap Method is. It's taken from a concept I recently learned called the Organized Mum Method, which is basically a cleaning concept designed by mums to help more efficiently manage your household chores. It breaks the chores down into tasks that are performed daily, weekly, monthly, or at different intervals. By doing small chunks each day, it saves you time from having to perform all of the tasks in one go, which nobody has time for. At JHC, we have applied a very similar method to how we manage our flare projects. Everything we're going to talk about today saves us time. It ensures we deliver top quality help to our clients on time and gives us everything we need as a team. We're hoping by sharing these methods with you today, you'll be able to take away some of what we do and apply it to your own teams. First of all, I would just like to put a poll out there to find out how your team works. So if you could just answer the question that's on screen. That's fantastic. It looks like we've got a real mix of results there. We've got quite a lot of people who are based in the same office um, and a lot of people who are in different locations, which is great. Our team is pretty similar to that and I'm just going to talk you through how our team works so you can get an idea of some of the problems we've encountered. So we are a team of four riders. There's myself in Newcastle, Eloise and Elaine in Birmingham, and last but not least, we have Karen, who's based in London. As well as being in different offices, we all work different hours. On a Monday, we're all in all day. On a Tuesday, we're all in in the morning, but Eloise goes home in the afternoon. We're all back in on a Thursday, on a Wednesday, sorry. And then on a Thursday morning, we're all in. But Thursday afternoon, I go home. And then come Friday, there's no Karen at all and Eloise and I disappear on a Friday afternoon, leaving poor Elaine all alone doing any work. So as you can imagine, we have faced quite a few issues with this setup. I'm gonna talk you through some of those issues now. You may even recognize some of these issues across your own teams, or you may face completely different ones. So issues as a team that we've faced are overwriting work, 
So we used to work in Word documents. We had no source control, which meant we sometimes overwrote each other's work. Duplicating work or missed requests, sometimes more than one of us would have been working on a request without realizing. And the opposite to that is that sometimes we missed a request because we assumed someone else was picking up the task. An unbalanced workload. The work wasn't always balanced. We each own different functional areas of the product. If a software release had a lot of work in one area, it meant some of us may have been sat with next to nothing to do, whilst others had too much to do. Key person dependent, I'm sure everyone's experienced this as an issue. We had a lot of key person dependent tasks. For example, only I knew how to set up Google Analytics and fix HTML problems. So if I was off, the rest of the team would have to wait until I was back in to fix these issues. And this could have prevented the support from being published. We also had issues with hard to find procedures. We had multiple folders with similar names and Word documents stored throughout. So it was really difficult to find the procedure that you needed. We also faced issues as writers, things like inconsistent writing styles. As writers, we all have different writing styles, but as we're all writing for the same product, this produced inconsistencies. For example, words that mean the same thing, but that can be spelled differently, indexes or indices, advisor or advisor. Different words that mean the same thing, like function or program, or even because of the industry we work in, the capitalization of words, in this example, crest. We had issues with Word versus online. We imported all of our Word documents into the Flare Help, and Word is very linear. But with the online content, you can open up any page as your starting page. So when we did do this conversion, we had topics that were just titles and nothing else on the page. And there were a lot of pages with no introduction as they were following on from a previous page when they were in Word. We also had varied quality. Sometimes not all the links work, sometimes you would forget to update tables of contents, and even in some cases there may have been missed spelling mistakes. I would just like you to raise your hand if you have experienced any of these issues. So if you can just click on the hand icon there, it'd be great to see who has experienced these issues. quite a few people there so thank you for that hopefully we'll be able to address a lot of these issues here so to address the issues of the team the overwriting the duplicate and the unbalanced workload and the key person dependency we created a team schedule and I'm just going to talk you through our schedule and how we make this fair for each person on the team we have four software releases per year. One each quarter. Each of these contain two cycles. This is the deadline that our developers work to to get their code into the software. When they get the code into the software, it produces release notes. And we use those release notes to analyze to see what we need to change in the support center. We publish the help in time for the software release date. So that's our key date. We might also make other changes to the help in between these dates. For example, some troubleshooting help, reorganizing the table of contents, minor corrections, spelling corrections, that kind of thing. So rather than waiting for the software release each quarter, we also do a publish each month to capture all of these changes. So we've got quite a lot going on. You might have more or less frequent publishers, but what I'm about to go through is adaptable to any structure. The first thing that we did was list all of our tasks that are required for a software release. So this is a breakdown for one quarter and we applied the dates. So you can see there's quite a lot going on in there. These are purely tasks to ensure that the help is up to date for the software release. It doesn't include any feedback or improvements or other day to day work that needs to be included. The most important date on here is the EDD. This is the delivery date of the software. So we need to ensure all of our help is up to date in line with that date. 
Next, we created roles and we assigned all of those tasks to these specific roles in the team to ensure the workload was balanced. So we have four key roles for each, each software release. The first role is the release manager. They manage the release. About a month before the release starts, they schedule in all of the meetings and reminders in our calendars for all of the tasks that are required during the release cycle. They are responsible for ensuring everyone is on target for achieving their delivery dates. Next, we have the communications manager. They're responsible for analysing those release notes to ensure they're assigned to the correct authors and for sending out the new release communications to our clients. Then we have a PDF manager who produces and publishes the PDFs and a support centre manager who does the same but for the online help. We then assign a person in the team to each one of these roles. So for example, I might be the release manager for one release, Elaine could be the communications manager, Eloise the PDF manager and Karen the support centre manager. These roles then rotate for every release so that each person has the opportunity to perform the tasks within each role once a year. This means you're never key person dependent and your knowledge is kept up to date. You might be thinking, how does this relate to Flare? Well, this is where Flare comes in. We have an internal Flare project that stores all of our documentation procedures. Within this project, we have all of our scheduling information including the steps for the release manager to follow, which explain how to create the schedule. The release manager follows these steps and they have a template which lists all of those jobs that I showed you on the timeline earlier and the role that's responsible for each one. The release manager copies the template for each release. Then they open up the rotor to see who is responsible for each role and they apply those initials into the template. Then they open up the software schedule to get all those all important dates from the cycles and the delivery dates. And then they apply those dates and the initials into the schedule. So you can see from this one that we have the dates when each task needs to be completed by and the initials of who is going to be completing this task. We also have a shared calendar and the release manager uses this calendar to schedule in the events inviting the required team member to the event, which also creates the reminder in our diaries. Some of these tasks are for all of us to perform. So we link to the specific pages that explain them in more detail. Some are just reminders to perform a particular task. For example, our housekeeping task is for each of us to perform on a regular basis. So it's set up as a reminder in our calendars. And the housekeeping involves checking broken links, broken bookmarks, unused images, topics with missing concepts, missing alias file links, and topics that aren't in the table of contents. There's also a task for the release manager to perform a final housekeeping check, which ensures nothing get missed. You may have different tasks that you perform, a bigger team or different requirements in regards to the roles you need. Whatever the circumstances, if you create a rotor, you can ensure that specific tasks are performed at the right times and that the work is evenly distributed. This ensures everyone contributes, you trust each other, and there is a shared responsibility amongst the team. It's not always perfect. As we're continuously improving the efficiency of the team, we often change the procedures. Each team member only performs the specific role once a year. So when they do come to do the tasks, they may find an easier way of doing it, or something may longer, no longer be necessary due to advances in technology. If this does happen, we have fortnightly team meetings where we discuss any changes we think may be necessary and agree as a team the best way to move forward. We then add this information into our procedures so it's always growing and always changing. Now I'm going to pass you on to Eloise, who is going to go into more detail about the guidelines and procedures that solve our issues as writers. Brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Um, OK, so Caroline has talked all about how we are 
organised in terms of getting our support centre published. But what about actually writing our content in the first place? Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we manage that side of things and also how we've addressed some of those issues Caroline mentioned at the start. Things like inconsistent writing styles, varied quality, and also that move from writing in Word documents for just a PDF user guide to actually writing topic based content within Flare to publish as both an online support centre and also PDFs as well. So I'm just going to kick off the slideshow. Okay, um, so before I go into detail about our guidelines, I've got another poll for you to find out what kind of writing guidelines you currently work from. Okay, give that a few more moments just to get the last few votes in. Okay, so we've got a little bit of variation, but over half of you have team guidelines that you control yourselves. And uh, JHC are also in that category as well. So we have um, full control over our guidelines. Um, so we do have the opportunity to kind of, as Caroline mentioned, continually improve those to make sure that they work as well as possible for us. Our writing guidelines sit within that same FLARE project that Caroline showed you earlier with our scheduling. So we have a documentation area and within that we have our writing guidelines. Now, before I go into the detail about um, what we currently have, I just wanted to quickly take you on our journey for how we've developed those because um, they weren't like this straight away we've been through a few iterations as we have kind of tried to make sure that they're as useful as possible for us as a team. So when I started writing user guides at JHC Karen was already here writing them and to get me started she asked me to write in third person and use the present tense and she put together quite a minimalist user guide template which back then was in a Word document that had kind of a front page and some numbered headings just for me to kind of get writing in. And that was pretty much it. As we went on and we expanded the team and Elaine and Caroline came on board, we wanted to give them a little bit more help to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So we created our writing guidelines document, which had kind of guidelines for how to uh, document a kind of a standard screen within the software, things like styling. So back then, because we we're in Word, sort of applying bold to field names, things like that. And as we went on and we started doing more with our help, we started adding some more guideline documents in. So we ended up with quite a lot of documents talking about different software that we were using. We introduced kind of source control, context sensitive help. And these are all separate Word documents and they were all stored in separate folders within a shared drive. Now we found that working like this did present us with a few issues. The first issue was that our writing guidelines had kind of become too detailed to actually be helpful. When we work, we all review each other's work and as part of that, we'll kind of add suggestions, add feedback. And we found that as a team, we were trying to work every single suggestion made back into a rule into our writing guidelines. That meant that we were always in there maintaining them and they became quite large and quite detailed and it wasn't the nicest kind of resource to work from. 
To help us address that, we decided to take a step back and really kind of think about what we wanted to achieve with those different suggestions. And a lot of the time, it wasn't about having a specific rule for that one scenario, that one sentence that we'd read where we kind of added that feedback on. Most of them were really around just writing nice content, things like readability, that kind of thing. So we took a step back and looked at our writing guidelines as a whole and actually pulled a lot of those sort of detailed rules into much more kind of high level um, overall sort of holistic guidelines that were aimed much more at just making sure what we wrote was clear and readable and nice to consume. The next thing we found was that we just had too many procedures and they were all split out and it was a nightmare to find what you wanted. You'd end up going to about three different documents before you found that little instruction that you needed. So we reviewed what we had, we looked through it and found that actually some of what we could get rid of because it was old, we had a new procedure, we weren't even using that software anymore, things like that. Some of it we could consolidate and um, quite a bit of it we could kind of rework just to make it nice and easy to use. The big step forward on this was actually getting it into Flare. So bringing it into that big Flare project that we got with all of our procedures in, it meant that we could build one consolidated site that was searchable, which meant finding the information you needed was so much easier. It also meant that we could present it nicely so we could put in things like drop downs, that kind of thing, to make it really easy to consume. The other thing we found that was a lot of our procedures were actually written with writing in Word in mind um, and also generating a PDF output. And that for us has been quite a big journey overall is moving from that sort of linear style of writing to more kind of topic based authoring. So for our writing guidelines, we've pulled in loads of kind of the information, the inspiration that we've had um, as part of that journey to get it up to date with what we're now doing. And things like the Mad World Conference, other conferences before Mad World came to Europe, um, we used to go to a UA Europe conference, have been really instrumental in kind of shaping how we now write. They introduced us to people like Steve Krug, who wrote Don't Make Me Think, which is all about website usability and user experience. And also Mark Baker, who wrote Every Page is Page One, which is all about topic-based authoring for technical communication. And so that's things like Caroline mentioned, understanding that with a searchable site, your users can land on any page from the search results and that to make sure their experience is good, you wanna have a nice introduction that gives some context, grounds them, lets it, them know really clear that they're in the right place for what they want, or maybe if they're not in quite the right place, you're helping them get to where they need to be. We've also incorporated information from other kind of resources, so things like blog posts, webinars, uh, podcasts, um, journals, and even books. So we've pulled from loads of different sources to kind of help us on that transition to writing um, for an online output. And we've worked all of that back into our writing guidelines as well. So this is what we have currently. So you can see um, there are quite high level things, so things like thinking about structure, presenting a visually appealing format, so making sure that when somebody opens up a page with their help, it's not just a huge block of text that actually you're breaking things down so it's really easy to scan it, find the little bit that they need so then they can get their task done and move on. Things like knowing your audience and writing clearly and concisely as well. We have a whole little section for every page is page one because that's been really helpful for us in kind of shaping the way we write now. 
and I've also included a slide with our bibliography on so that if you do want to go and look at any of those resources in a little bit more detail uh, you can do and uh, as Joshua mentioned we are recording the webinar so uh, if you don't have a chance to jot those down now you can always go back to the recording and have a look then. We don't just have the high level writing guidelines, we do also have some specific guidelines as well, because sometimes you do just need a rule. Um, so we've got things like for numbers, when to write that as words, when to use digits, and um, the preferred words, so things like advisor or advisor. So we have got reference in place that we can all um, check to make sure that we are all writing consistently. As well as that, we also have an area in our uh, big project for all things flair. So this has got things like our styles, which styles we use. For example, we use heading one and heading two, but we don't use heading three. So we've got those listed out when we use those. So again, we know that we're all working consistently with each other. We also have page for images, so things like red boxes, what width of line to use, what shade of red, um, whether it's got rounded corners or not, things like that, just again to make sure we are all consistent across the team. We have an area within images for styling as well, just so that um, we've got a bit of help there. Sometimes it takes a couple of goes to get the images looking right in all the different outputs, so we've just got some help there, um, a little bit of troubleshooting to make sure that uh, we've got that support when we need it. One thing to mention as well is that we do make use of the templates functionality within Flare, so this is one of our templates that we have in place. And we work a lot of our writing guidelines back into the templates so that they are there when we need them. We are also always changing these, as Caroline mentioned. So, for example, what I've highlighted there is that we've got a little note that says drop down headings should use sentence case. It's not like when we first set out our writing guidelines, we knew from day one that's what we were going to do. This actually came about because in reviewing each other's work and also using our support centre as we're working with the software. One of us noticed that actually some of us were using sentence case and some of us were using title case. And in scenarios like that, what we'll do is we'll add it to the agenda for our next team meeting, have a chat about it as a team, decide what we want to do going forwards, in this case using sentence case, and we'll add that into the writing guidelines in our project, but also into our template. This means that it's there sort of immediately when we need it. We don't have to think, oh yeah, we discussed that in a team meeting about six months ago. What was it that we decided again? We've got it right there, easy to refer to, so that it makes our lives as easy as possible and also means that staying consistent is really nice and easy too. The next thing I want to talk about our reviews and these are really focused around that kind of quality piece that we mentioned at the start so i've got another poll for you this is uh, the last one of the presentation and um, so if you could answer those uh, questions there and we'll have a look at the results Okay, so I've got a, a split between two that are the most popular. So um, the majority of people either have a subject matter expert review their work or both a technical writer and a subject matter expert. And that's what we do at JHC. We have two kind of reviews for each piece of content that we write. And I'd encourage anyone that isn't currently sending things for review, if you can get someone to look over it, it's a really good idea. So what we do at JHC is, let's say I've written a new page. 
what I'll do is I will ask the documentation team if anybody is available to review that and Caroline might reply and say yep yeah, she's got availability what I'll do is I will send Caroline a link to an internal test site that we have so that she can see the changes that I'm planning to publish at this point they aren't going out to clients at all they are just for internal viewing and that means that she can see what it's all going to look like when we do finally publish that when Caroline reviews it she will add her comments within flair so she'll just go into the topic and she will use annotations or track changes or a combination of the two to give me her feedback at the same time I will also send it to the subject matter expert for that area when I was putting this presentation together that was Tom so he gets his picture on screen now um, but it's generally say the lead developer or the designer for the project that we're documenting and just same as Caroline I will send him a link to our internal test site so that he can see my changes he doesn't have access to Flare, we don't uh, use Contribute or anything like that, so generally he will send me his feedback in an email. Because we work quite closely with the development teams as we document, generally for the subject matter expert review we don't get a huge amount of changes back it will tend to just be on the kind of the technical side of things um, so maybe we need to read word something slightly to get it exactly technically correct with how the software actually works that kind of thing so usually an email is enough for that if we're writing say something that is very technical or that we're maybe not as confident about we do sometimes generate a word document from within flare um, so that the subject matter expert can add their comments on using um, kind of comments or track changes within the word document then once we've had all that feedback through i will then go and work those changes back into my uh, topic before I publish it. The way that we have it set up so that this kind of process is possible is that we have an automated overnight process that builds three targets from our Flare project. And this is set up using um, the Windows Task Scheduler and we will do an automated pull so we use git for our source control so we'll pull all the changes to make sure that we've got the most up-to-date version and then we'll use a flare batch target to then build those three different outputs and we build an online help that we call our external build and that has only got completed and reviewed work in so there's no kind of uh, work in progress in here this is ready for us to publish to our clients and that means that on any given day if we want to um, publish a new version of our support center so we've made a little correction and we want that to go out immediately we can pick up this build push it out to the server and it's ready to go the second target we build is our internal online help so this is where we do have all of our work in progress and this is the site that I use to send out for reviews so it means that people can see exactly how it's going to look when it's finally published but there's no danger of kind of half finished work or unreviewed changes being visible to clients the final build that we do is a PDF build so each of the kind of different areas that we cover is available as a PDF guide as well as in the online help and we just do one build for these and that includes work in progress and that is because one we want to be able to check the changes in the PDF look okay before we send it out and two we only publish our PDFs on a quarterly basis so if there is that sort of small correction we'll just do it in the online help we won't worry about republishing PDFs and we know that by the end of the quarter all of our changes will be complete they will all be reviewed and signed off so we can pick these up and push them out to clients 
the way this all works is it runs off a condition. So we have a WIP, work in progress condition, that we can apply to any of our work that we haven't had checked over yet or that we maybe haven't finished at the end of the day. Um, and that just is set up with our different targets. So the external target is set to exclude any work in progress. We also have it linked in with our templates. So our template for a new topic is conditioned with the work in progress flag already. So you don't even need to remember to put it on. All you need to do is once it's all reviewed and amended, take that off and then you know that's ready to be published. One thing that we did notice with our review process was that each of us have our kind of different focuses. So the review you got back would maybe vary slightly depending on who you sent it to. So for example, Karen knows the whole system really well. So she's really good at picking up on where you might want to put a cross reference in to a different area. I'm quite a visual person. So I'll often suggest maybe putting in a diagram or um, restructuring the page a little bit just to make it really nice and uh, scannable. Elaine knows the writing guidelines inside out, so she's really good at kind of picking up where maybe you haven't been consistent. And Caroline's got a great eye for structure, so things like suggesting maybe moving your content around a little bit just to get that flow really nice. Now that's not to say that we are completely siloed within those areas. When I'm reviewing, I also have an eye on the writing guidelines. I'm thinking about structure as well, but it's just we are individuals, we each have our kind of natural focus, and we did kind of see that, you know, different people had a kind of a different skew to the review. And we wanted to go from that sort of situation to something more like this, where regardless of who you sent your work to review, um, you'd get all of those really kind of good suggestions, that really useful feedback back from everyone. The way we've managed that side of things is to put in place a review checklist. This is just a document that's split out with kind of things to be thinking about as you do your review. So it just means that we're not forgetting any of those kind of different aspects as we're doing the reviews. So we'll look at um, putting in a kind of an overview sort of general impressions of the guide, so a sort of one or two line summary. And then we've got sections for things like show and tell. So this is a really nice one. This is where if we notice that somebody's maybe done something a little bit different, something that really works super well, we'll flag it up on their review. So we'll fill this out and that's really nice as somebody getting their review back to kind of see, oh, they liked what I did there. And what we'll also do is we'll add it as an item to our next team meeting and we'll share that with the rest of the team. And that's a really nice way to kind of celebrate success, but also kind of encourage and share innovation so that good ideas aren't just sat with one person on the team. We're sharing those with everybody so we can all be thinking about that when we next write. So that's a really nice little section on the on the review checklist. We have a whole section just for our titles, and that's uh, mostly because we did pull in a lot of content from linear Word documents into our Flare project for online help. And we noticed that titles were one of the big things that we kind of needed to do a bit of work on to get things like search working really nicely for our users. So when we first pulled our content in, we would get search results a little bit like this, where we had kind of standard sections within each of those different guides. We had about 150 separate PDF use guides, which is fine when you're just within that PDF, but when you bring it all into a consolidated system, you get duplicate search results, which isn't that helpful. 
We also found that once we gave people a search, they were searching for things like program names. So a lot of our users will know the actual program name for the screen they want. LKJ200 is a kind of a really main sort of screen that's used a lot for our client details. And sort of in that older version of our support center, they would get results like this back where it's really not clear which of those is kind of the main page for that screen. And in actual fact, it's none of those. The page that we would really want people to go to, to click on first, if they're trying to learn about that screen and that area of the system, was right down on page 15 of our search results. And really helpfully, it was just called opening screen. So we've done a lot as we've kind of rewritten our content and as we're reviewing content to make sure that our titles are really useful. So now instead of opening screen, we have a topic that is called client accounts. And we've got a new rule in place that basically says we're only allowed to put the program name in the title of the main topic for that area. And that makes sure that it goes to that number one spot in the search results. And there's no kind of ambiguity that's the screen, that's the page that we'd want people to click on. So we think about our titles a lot. We also think about our introductions a lot, thinking about every page is page one, that sort of website usability thing, making sure that every page has a good introduction that gives people plenty of context. And we also include things like disambiguation links to help them get where they need to be. Readability is kind of the heart of reviews so that's just looking at what we've written and thinking does it make sense have we assumed anything that maybe we shouldn't have is it nice and easy to consume if there's kind of complex concepts going on have we got diagrams worked examples in there to really help people get to grips with things as quickly as possible we also have a section for helpfulness and best practice, so things like including recommended settings, making sure that any procedures that we've written out match as closely as possible to what our users experience in the real world, including error messages to really kind of encourage them to use our support centre as kind of self-service support, use our help before they call our help desk up. We have sections for formatting, so just making sure that all those styles are applied correctly, um, for single sourcing to make sure that we are using things like snippets and variables wherever we can. We also look at our table of contents because in making sure that our titles are really kind of specific to each page, that they're as useful as possible for search results, a lot of them are grown a bit longer and that could make our table of contents look a little bit messy so we'll actually go through and make sure those labels are nice and neat as succinct as possible to help sort of scan uh, that menu on the right um, so people can find what they need as easily as possible. We also have an item to check our PDFs um, because we tend to work in the online help in that internal site day to day um, and occasionally in our PDFs maybe an image won't look quite right once it's um, pulled through into that so we will check those to make sure that they're built correctly and everything looks okay. Our review process um, works really well. And just to kind of talk you through why I think it's so important, I've got kind of my emotional journey as I go through that process. So this is me when I have written my user guide. I'm feeling pretty happy. I think it's good to go. It's ticked off my list, lovely. This is me when I get my review comments back. I go through a whole range of emotions, anger, disbelief, frustration, anxiety. Once that knee-jerk reaction is over, I will actually start thinking about them seriously, looking through those comments, taking on board what the reviewer said. And it's worth noting at this point that our reviews are not a kind of super strict one-way thing. It's not like getting your homework back and it's all just marked in red pen and you just have to accept that. If I'm not sure about a comment, maybe I disagree, maybe I don't quite understand what the reviewer is getting at, 
I'll pick up the phone and I will have a chat with them. It is always a conversation. So we'll talk through it and I'll maybe explain why I've done something in the way that I have. They'll take that on board and say, all right, I see. OK, have you thought about maybe trying this instead? And we'll work together to kind of figure out what's going to be best for our users. And then I'll go away and I will work all of that feedback back into my content. And then by the end of the review process, I'm feeling like this because every single time it makes my work better. And that's what I want at the end of the day. I want to be creating really high quality content that our users will find really helpful. And our review process makes sure that I can do that. So I would thoroughly encourage you to uh, work that in if you can. And that is my bit of the presentation done. So, Gio, do we have any questions, please? Yeah, so thank you, you too. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, we've had some great questions asked and a lot of good feedback. Um, so, and this was asked behind the scenes that we're going to get to. Um, but just a quick reminder before we get to those questions uh, Mad World. Uh, so Mad World 2020 has been announced and early registration has opened. Uh, you can save up to 1600 on this event by registering by the end of the year. Uh, you can go on our website and click on that Mad World banner to register and get that discount. Also, calls for papers have gone out. So if you didn't get that email to submit, please drop us an email if you're interested in submitting a presentation for next year. Um, but I really encourage you to go ahead and check out those early registration discounts because they are significant and we would like to see you all there. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get back to some questions. Uh, so lots of great questions in here and we don't have time to go over all of them, but I flagged a few that I saw that would be uh, that would be helpful for our viewers. Um, just, all right, so one question. It looks like a lot of them work, wanted to know about your source control. Um, so what version control tool do you use? And do you use the uh, source control ribbon in Flare or do you use the command line? good question um, we use git via source tree for our source control um, just because that's kind of in line with what the rest of the company does and um, we found that that worked best for our team um, so we'll usually use the source tree interface for doing kind of commits pushes and pulls um, the only time we really use command line is for that automated build. So we have um, kind of a pull request that will hook in with the Windows task scheduler to do a build once we've kind of all gone home, pushed our changes for the day. Um, day to day, though, it, it's generally through source tree. Thank you. All right, another question. Um, someone noticed that you uh, do use JIRA. Now, have you incorporated the organized mom method into JIRA to track the writing tasks and schedules? We we haven't actually. We do we do use JIRA as a company, um, and our developers use JIRA more than us. The only part of the um, JIRA that we actually use is we assign ourselves to projects within JIRA. Um, so when a project is created for a client, we'll assign an author to the project and that ensures that we have full visibility of the development from beginning to end so that we're involved in handovers, we're involved in demos um, and involved throughout the whole development cycle for that particular project. And that's how we have the really close relationship with our developers so that what we're writing is in line with what they're developing. All right, um, another question here. So uh, they said, our engineers rarely stick to the schedule they've established. Now, as a result, it's nearly impossible for our team to work on a regular timeline. Have you experienced this problem and how have you adapted to it? I would say we, we have experienced that problem. Sometimes the developers don't hit the deadlines that they have in place for the actual software release. If we need to adapt for that, we still write the content in line with what is going to be developed because we have that close relationship, we have the visibility 
of what is going to go into the software so we can be adaptable in the sense that we can hide that content when we publish the release and then publish it at a later date when the product is ready to be released to the clients so we're still writing the content so it's ready it's there but it's flagged as our work in progress so you can see it in the overnight build the developers can still read it we can still read it internally but it doesn't get published to our clients until the actual product is out there Right, and a question about reviews. Um, so annotations or track changes, um, do you have a couple pros and cons for, for uses for each of them? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I find annotations a bit nicer to work with personally, um, just because with the track changes, um, those kind of don't get pulled through to our overnight build until they're accepted. So I find it a little bit harder to kind of see what it will look like once those are all in. So I tend to kind of only use track changes for things I think are going to be not too controversial. So just little things like spelling mistakes or like changing a comma here and there, that it will be very easy to just kind of go through and accept those all. And then anything that's maybe a little bit chunkier, I will use an annotation for that so that, again, can kind of have that conversation around it. Um, it leaves the person who originally wrote the content a little bit more freedom as as the owner of that to write things how they want to present them so I tend to mostly use annotations and only use track changes for sort of little things how about you Caroline yeah I, I agree um, I think the track changes is great for a missing full stop or a spelling mistake but to get the writer to really think about what they're writing I think the annotations are much better they know that they know the content better than me as the reviewer but I can give them advice on how I would like to see the content or what parts I don't fully understand so sometimes I can't even put track changes in if I don't fully understand that area so I, I would put a comment in to say this this part doesn't really make that much sense to me could you explain it in a different way or could you put in a diagram could you put a flow chart in that kind of thing and it really gets that use the writer thinking about their content as well all right and so it looks like we have time for one more question here um, so what pro do you use any programs to create your flow charts we do. We use uh, Lucidchart to create our flowcharts. That's our, the main product that we use. Um, I don't know if we've used anything in the past. Eloise, have you used anything else? That... Uh, a brief flirtation with Visio, but not. We d I don't think we had many licenses within the company for that, so it tended to be quite tricky in that maybe somebody would send you a Visio loose a Visio flowchart and then you couldn't get in to edit it. Um, mm. So yeah, I think a little bit, but not much. Um, other than that, it was just things like paint, that kind of thing. So yeah, Lisa chart has been really, really helpful for us to get those, get those in. Great. Um, so, well, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, now, the questions queue is going to be open for just a minute longer, so feel free to keep popping those into the queue. Uh, now, if we didn't get to any of your questions live, uh, not to worry, we will be sending out a question and answer document uh, sent out to everybody, so we'll be getting that together for you all in the next day or so. Um, so, fantastic presentation. Once again, a thank you to our speakers, Caroline and Eloise. Uh, thank you for taking the time to share uh, some knowledge and thank you all for joining. Uh, we hope that you have a fantastic rest of the week and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Uh, take, care, take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.